All right. So let's start our six parts of structural immunology. Everything you need to know about structural immunology in three hours, roughly, okay? So the first three parts are gonna be this Friday. Next Friday will be the last three parts. The first thing I want to do is I want to talk about immunology. How many people have taken or even are taking immunology right now? So we've got a couple people. I wonder, I don't know how much Dr. Pratt goes through this stuff. Uh, if you have something to add, do please step in. I have never taken a course in immunology. Actually, I haven't taken a biology course since ninth grade, okay? Um, so I am very much a chemist at heart, and I might get some of this stuff wrong, but I'm sort of self-taught when it comes to this because I'm a biochemist first, and then I found out there's all this cool work to do with structural immunology, specifically with T cells, and now I'm working with antibodies. The people who are um, doing the lab project in my lab this year, of course, you made the fragments if you were in 4362 with me. Those fragments, we're going to test them for binding to antibodies. Now, you can test for binding without really knowing much about the antibody, maybe the molecular weight, right? But you don't really know. We don't have crystal structures of these antibodies. What is their structure, and how does the structure, the biochemistry, work to make the immune function happen? first thing we have to start is not where I started, but where the world sort of started, because they started with immunology by looking at cells and how organisms defend themselves against the parasites and the uh, microbes that are trying to get the resources that we've collected for ourselves, you know, the sugars, the fats, the stuff that we build our bodies from. It's food to them. How do we prevent other things from eating us? Big things from eating us, that's biology. Little things from eating us, that's immunology, and that has to do with chemistry. So, it actually starts with starfish. Before we get to starfish, I want to show you the ultimate goal. We're going to talk about cancer therapy. And if you think about it, your immune system defends you against things that are not you. And the tumor, even though it starts off as you, becomes a sort of zombified kind of cell, right? It starts growing uncontrollably. It won't listen to you when you tell it to stop growing. So you need some cells that are going to be like this little pink T cell right here. Big blue ovarian cancer cell. But you see that that T cell is resulting in the ovarian cancer cell going away. There's about probably 25, 30 events that we can talk about that are behind this. But I want you to know, and people who are in immunology, go ahead and bring in some immunology. If you're in cell biology, there's some cell biology going on here. And there's definitely some biochemistry in those things. So give me some molecular events that are going on in this image. A molecular event. Alessandro. OK, so they're clearly coming together. And there's some way in which this is recognizing bad cell, OK? Uh, cell, target cell is the way we want to do it. So apoptosis, can you describe apoptosis for people like me who didn't have biology? Uh, so a cell on its own for activating mechanisms for its breakdown. Yeah. Right. There's sort of a self-destruct mode. Program yeah. Cell yeah, program cell death. Because the cell has a program in it. And it literally is like the self-destruct code. Uh, except, of course, it's mediated by molecules, molecular biology. How all that works is another whole field. So that's happening, recognition on the front end. Possibly apoptosis or something like um, something like cell killing rather than cell death from the T cell side. Uh, and anything else that we can know that's going on, anything that's going on, molecular event that you can describe at any level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can even see little bubbles forming. There's probably holes in some way happening in the, in the membrane. And the recognition event we were talking about, that's atoms coming together. So yeah, let's get down to the atoms. What's happening inside the, um, inside the T cell? We've talked about what's happening at the other side. What kind of events are happening inside the T cell? When we say it's activated, what does that mean? The T cell becomes activated. Exactly. 
Exactly. And the, the, ca the cascade is hugely important. It has to do with cell signaling. When you have an event happening inside the cell, you know there are molecular signaling events. And the cascade usually involves some kind of phosphorylation, kinases. It can involve other things, but you have a lot of kinase activity going on. And in fact, some kind of dysregulation of the kinases may have led to the cancer, to the fact that this cell was growing uncontrollably. So with all of that, how does the T cell do that? How does it recognize this is a cell I should kill? Because you don't just want the T cell going around and killing every cell. That's, that's blunt. That's like chemotherapy is for us. We're, we give a chemical to someone that kind of kills all their cells, and we hope it kills the cancer more than the patient. That's a crude chemotherapy. Um, we, can, the, we can be a little bit more precise. Cells can be a lot more precise. How do they do it? So we've got to start with who was the first immunologist. And um, I may tell a story about Siddhartha Mukherjee better, later. So I men mentioned that he, during COVID, he actually wrote this uh, sort of primer on immunology. And because I never had the class in immunology, it actually told me a lot of things I didn't know. For example, it started with Meshnikov, who was um, on vacation in Sicily. And he started asking a scientific question. You don't have to. I guess he didn't really have good work-life balance, but I think he enjoyed this. So I think it was a little bit like play. Because he was actually, he had taken refuge from political turmoil in Odessa, of all places. Um, and he observed, he had a split, there was a splinter in the transparent body of a starfish larva. Because it was transparent, he could observe that there were small cells that appeared to be surrounding it. Later, those cells would engulf other cells, literally eat them. and so. Phage is the word for eating. Phagocytosis is the name for this. And they are called phagocytes because they appear to be eating other cells. So he, um, he wanted to study this. And he had a great system because it was transparent. And so he started to say, uh, he, this is his own drawing of it. So he would sit there and he would uh, sit on the beach. And I think that he was sort of distracted from his vacation after that. He, he's, his family sort of played. And he was drawing. Um, and he, he uh, started to injure by splinters and by cauterization. And he started to see that there were certain cells that would respond to wounds and to injury. And so he wanted to know what these were. And he counted how many hours, five hours after cauterization, the cells looked like this. And in fact, I think there's one sort of cell called dendritic cells. So one looked like a tree. And so you said it was a dendritic cell. These actually come down to, in some cases, macrophages are still a major type of immune cell. And so you see the word phage that is in that. So Meshnikov did a lot of experiments on this. And he figured out that this was independent of the blood and it was independent of the brain. So it was literally a new system, even with its own um, roads, in a sense. If the blood vessels are roads for the blood, this was independent in some way from blood vessels. And in fact, that's only more true for us than it is for starfish. You know, the, uh, he noticed that there is, there, it's not nerves. It's not blood vessels. So we have another uh, set of roads in the body called the lymph. And the lymph nodes are where those roads come together. They're sort of the gas stations or the truck stops in the middle of the road there. And so the, uh, he was studying this. And notice that this was actually just 50 years ago that he was writing about this. This has all happened within the past 100 years. So here's a square of bacteria. And if you put an immune system, this is called a neutrophil, but this is the undergoing phagocytosis. And you can see it's just like a little video game with Pac-Man eating. You guys know Pac-Man, right? OK. Pac-Man eating the pellets, except it's eating the bacteria. How does this happen on a molecular level? Once we started to discover how proteins worked, of course, 1960s were the same time we were getting the first structures of proteins. And now we are um, getting structures of where all the atoms are when this stuff is going on. So I just want to point out that this is truly a different system. And the thing about the lymph system is that it really is a different system for transport. This can be seen, for example, in humans. Uh, if you ha I don't know if anyone has a tattoo. If you want to show it off, we can, we can do it. But, um, uh, I don't have one yet, but we'll talk about um, what I should get. Probably a little T-cell or something like that. I don't know. But um, the thing is, when you get a tattoo, you have a permanent ink put under your skin. 
it turns out that that is a, a foreign element. And the good news is, usually, your immune system does not react to that. It doesn't freak out. How does it know not to react to this foreign substance? Well, it actually will take it, and it will move it through the lymph to a lymph node. And you can literally see this if you look at tattooed people. You know, the tattoo, the ink is put down there. And there could be some passive transport where it just sort of diffuses to the lymph. But more than that, there's active transport where there's immune cells. Their job is to sort of pick up stuff by the side of the road. And they take it to the lymph because they don't know what to do with it. They don't know whether this is good or bad. So they show it to the other cells in the lymph. And the lymph is where they all sit around and they say, oh, that looks bad. Usually for tattoo inks, they decide, oh, OK, well, let's not freak out about that. Let's just uh, let that one go. And so for example, if you see people who've donated their bodies to science, if they had tattoos, and you look at their lymph nodes, their lymph nodes are also tattooed. So a tattoo is definitely more than skin deep. These are the inks that are in tattoos. They're organic molecules. Here's a porphyrin-like molecule. And uh, these are the colors that they are. Um, you know, so they can, this is a, uh, an orange one. This is a copper one that's green. And you can see these sections of the lymph the, um, actually, I believe on the left, there are uh, skin pieces. And on the right, there are lymph node biopsies. And so you, you can see that the lymph nodes get tattooed. And this shows the active transport of the non-self molecule to the lymph. So just to show you, yeah, I mean, lymph is literally a, a separate network. You can have um, the lymph nodes. If you, if you know anybody who's had cancer treatment, they always check the lymph nodes. And uh, you have some up here. Sometimes those get swollen in the neck. The ones under the armpits are particularly important. And there's ones, um, but they're also accessible. And so those are what cancer treatment often involves, looking at the lymph to make sure the cancer is not spreading from its original site. Because if it's going to spread anywhere, it's going to, um, you know, it can spread through any of the, it can spread through either blood or lymph, I should say. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, on this, the other important part of the immune system is the bone marrow. Because these cells have to be made somewhere. The lymph node is where they all congregate, but they're born, the nursery, is in the bone marrow. And if you think about this, this makes perfect sense. The bone marrow is where you get red blood cells, and it's also where you get white blood cells. And remember that the the white blood cells can travel through the, uh, the blood itself, obviously. If you've ever spun down blood, you can see that there's definitely white blood cells in the, in the blood. But the lymph has a special function, OK? So when you talk about what was the first vaccination, there were actually people who sort of figured out if you give a small dose of something, it will actually protect you against a big dose of it later. And this was way before smallpox uh, in China. There was, they noticed that there were healers that went around. They, um, they did not catch the illness again. And uh, the survivors of the disease were actually enlisted to take care of new victims because they knew they had some sort of protection. They inferred that your body learns from exposure to a disease. And honestly, there's a lot of people that I think should learn about this. Immunology is really amazing, and it's amazing what the immune system can do. I see some people online on Twitter right now talking like, oh, we're certain to have another wave. It's going to be worse than the last one. I'm like, I don't really know. Evolution could throw a lot of things at us. But we do have something on our side. In a sense, we have evolution on our side because our immune system can evolve to meet these new variants. And so there is an arms race, but both sides are armed in this case. So this is kind of gross, but um, Chinese doctors actually took smallpox scabs. They ground it up, and they put it into a child's nose with a long pipe. They're always experimenting on children when you look at this. It's Jenner did this too, and I'm kind of like, leave the kids alone. But it uh, did actually protect that kid. It worked. So it's good news, I guess. So um, Jenner is the Western father of immunology. And in fact, this is well before Meshnikov. Uh, in 1796, he figured out that cowpox and smallpox were similar enough that you could give someone cowpox, they wouldn't get as sick, and they would be protected against smallpox. You can talk about how he deduced this. Here's another thing, but the thing I want to do is that Jenner did not do everything right. 
In fact, ethically, he actually, there's some really shady ethics, and again, it involves children. He took cowpox and he gave it to an eight-year-old. I believe it's the son of his gardener or something like that. And it's very not clear. This is definitely not informed consent, okay? Um, I don't think it could be informed consent. And two months later, he inoculated him with live smallpox. Again, good news as he was right, right? But let's get beyond moving like this. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing what people did sometimes. And the heroes are not really heroes all the time. So, but vaccine, our word for vaccine comes from the word for cowpox because vaca means cow. And of course, well, if you think about this, I mean, Jenner's behavior did not necessarily foster trust, you know, if he had uh, the way he was doing things. And when you don't foster trust, you end up with backlash. And there were cartoonists that were about, there were anti vaxxers from the very beginning. And there were misbehaving scientists from the very beginning. The good news is it clearly worked. So that's the other thing. Vaccines clearly work to prevent the disease. So at least we've got that on our side. But it's a lot more complex than just good guys versus bad guys. Okay. And in fact, here's an here's a illustration about people were afraid to take the cowpox because they were afraid this would happen to them. They'd start turning into a cow. Sound a little familiar to some of the things about vaccine shedding and things like that. And you know, it's easy to say, oh, of course it won't happen. But these fears are very real. And it is a necessary part of the process to give a small dose of something bad. I mean, we've got to realize when we're asking someone to get vaccinated, we really are asking for a large amount of trust. And we as medical professionals or as people who study medicine have to be worthy of that trust. And I want to say, I wish that Jenner didn't have this story in his background, but at least it says as a negative example of what not to do. So the thing about this is it can neutralize things that are infectious. Infectious things actually make toxins. But if you just get a toxin without the infectious thing, your immune system can actually respond to that as well, like botulism toxin. If you just get the toxin, it can respond to just the toxin. People figured out this. You know, they figured out it could respond to a lot of bad stuff. So for example, they knew veterinarians were the first ones on the um, experimental wagon here, in a sense. They knew that if an animal was infected with diphtheria, a toxin, given to another animal, that animal would be protected from tetanus, which was what produced that toxin. And this was not the, the growing agent. This was simply the toxic agent, the toxin that it produced. Okay. Um, so the serum contained antitoxin molecules, and they started to study those. They found out that they would, not, they would survive a lot of harsh treatment. They weren't cells, they didn't grow, they weren't alive, just like the toxin itself is not growing or alive. And so they said they were anti-corpers um, for the German, and that become corpus for body, antibodies for us. Now, this is really a little bit weird for us, because we think of antibodies as protecting our body. So they're kind of pro our body, right? And this always confused me. But they're called antibodies because they are not cells. OK, they are antibodies because they are proteins. And they didn't have the word protein, so they call them bodies. If you remember ketone bodies, same terminology, same idea. So they, were found, they eventually found to have a source. There were cells that made the antibodies. They were found by B cells that had matured, sort of leveled up. To use the Pokemon terminology, they had evolved, OK, although it's not the right terminology. Um, I, I love that Pokemon gets my kids comfortable with evolution. I don't um, know that it, get, it gives them sort of a Lamarckian view of evolution, but I figure that's better than nothing, you know? Um, so they had matured, not evolved, into plasma cells that are antibody factories. Each B cell is specific to a particular toxin or microbe, non-self molecule, whatever it is. So B cells are named B cells for the bursa, not the bone marrow, although that works to help you remember it, because they are made in the bone marrow. It's just so are T cells. And uh, in the chicken, the chicken has a special organ called the bursa that makes them. We have bone marrow that makes them. So evolution doesn't always do things the same way. But if you look at the way um, we make them, they are made as stem cells. That's what the SC means. 
in the bone marrow. They travel to the thymus, and um, they, they grow up and they learn, uh, or I'm sorry, the, some cells travel to the thymus and become T cells. That's why they're called T cells. Some cells never see the thymus, and they make antibodies. They're known as B cells. And the important thing about these cells, each cell is a special snowflake because each cell has its own genetic code that has been shuffled when it was born, just like us. And each cell has a unique receptor on the surface. So B cells, T cells. Today, next week. As they mature, the place where they learn and they figure out if um, the, sort of the library slash congregating room for the whole immune cell is the lymph node. That's where they all get together and they figure out whether they need to like um, be activated and to grow. And so the lymph node is where there are some other cells because you can't have that single B cell patrolling the whole body. Instead, so you have specialized cells that patrol and they bring stuff back to the lymph. Inside the lymph cell, there are B cell follicles surrounded by the T cell zone. And there's all sorts of cool cell biology if you want to get into that. But of course, if you know me, I'm more interested in the question, what do these receptors look like? What do antibodies look like? And how do they work on a chemical level? So I want you to watch a movie about how a B cell is born, OK? When a B cell is activated, actually, technically, it's not how it's born, but it's how it matures, growth of a B cell. Uh, through, the pro it's through the process of clonal selection. And it took them a while to figure out, but it is this guy, Frank McFarlane Burnett. And yes, he was a true Clan McFarlane member, just like myself. Okay, and he actually, uh, so I actually saw his book at like a used book sale. And I have it on my counter. I've never read it, but it, if you want to see his book, I have it on my shelf. But I trust that he got it right, so I'm just, because he's my Klansman, you know. Um, but you have basically uh, tens of thousands of randomized antibodies because you have tens of thousands of B cells, each one different, and each one able to be selected and then cloned into an entirely genetical po population, uh, genetically identical population. So I want you to watch a movie about that. It's about five minutes long, and that's going to be posted. On, that already is posted online. If you think of this, this is literally. Um, the title of a Star Wars movie. So it is actually, uh, this is what it's going to look like. No relationship to Attack of the Clones, except for it does have the right idea. It's like the, they take Jango Fett, right, and they clone him, and they make a whole army out of him. That actually is exactly how your immune system works. It's actually a lot more accurate than things like midichlorians, but um, that's another story for another time. OK, so I don't want to, this is where I'm going to cut myself off from talking about immunology. But if you do want to know a little bit more, there's a lot of people who have been very interested in it over the last two years. I posted these online just for your information. When I say FYI, it means I'm not going to test you on that. I'm not going to expect you. But hey, who knows? You might learn something. I don't guarantee you won't learn something from it. OK? Um, so this is a little cartoon. These are actually pretty nice and accurate. Uh, about how they, um, how, how it works. It's only four pages long. So please check that out. And that's part one.